Terrific. Great. Thank you. I think we're all uh, mic'd up now. Uh, we look forward to having a conversation here on the stage for a little bit, and then we'll open things up to the floor and, and take questions from uh, the audience as well. So we're really fortunate to have three great panelists here today. Um, I think you have handouts with all their full bios, so I won't run through all their accomplishments uh, here, but just sort of briefly introduce them. Uh, Irfan Nouradin is a professor at uh, the Walsh School of Foreign Policy uh, down the street at Georgetown University. Uh, Julia, you came from a little farther away. Uh, Julia Palmares is executive director of CPEC, which has been mentioned, uh, a think tank based in Buenos Aires. And then uh, Landry uh, Signy uh, from the African Growth in Initiative here at Brookings is also a David Rubenstein Fellow in the Global Economy and Development Program here. And uh, welcome all of you. Um, let me start off by um, asking our panelists to maybe just provide a, uh, a, an overview of what you think about democratic trends in the various regions that uh, you focus on. And in particular, maybe focus on what has happened in terms of the big elections in the region, and what that tells us or doesn't tell us about democratic trends uh, in the region or around the world. So, Landry, let me start with you. Obviously, we've had some big elections in the past year in South Africa. Um, maybe start there. Tell us what we've learned from that, and, and how does it speak to broader democratic trends in the region? Thank you very much uh, for the question. I would first like to... Uh Thanks, Sebastian, for organizing such a timely event on a critical topic. So uh, perhaps before speaking about the case uh, of South Africa, I would like to present a broader overview of the situation in Africa in general. Yeah. So uh, we have seen a substantial increase of accountability and citizen demand for uh, democracy on the continent. For example, uh, according to an Afrobarometer survey, about 77% of Africans uh, demand uh, democracy. About 75% uh, want a uh, two terms limit, and over 53% will prefer accountable uh, governments uh, compared uh, to non accountable governments but with faster decision making processes. So uh, overall, uh, most African citizens, according to Afro, Af Afro Barometer surveys, will prefer uh, accountable government of over efficient government. So that is uh, one important point. The second point also that I would like to highlight is the fact that as of uh, 1988, over 94% of uh, African countries were undemocratic. And if we just look at the past uh, five years, uh, about 55% of uh, the leaders in sub-Saharan Africa have changed. So this is, and 50% and of those change through meaningful and democratic elections. So I think those are some progress which are not uh, often highlighted. So of course, I, I may be discussing, so that demand for democracy is driven uh, uh, also uh, by accountability. If you, took, you take, for example, uh, the imperative <laughs> of uh, vertical accountability, so which means uh, free, fair, transparent, and meaningful elections, so the selection of leadership through uh, those criteria, of course, requiring a minimal level of uh, political rights, civil liberties, among order. Countries such as South Africa, Benin, Sao Tome, and Principe, uh, uh, Lesotho, Liberia, or Sierra Leone uh, have uh, uh, came to a change of leadership through free and fair election to a quality horizon, uh, vertical accountability. When we discuss uh, horizontal accountability, which means checks and balances, uh, if you look, uh, the case of South Africa will be telling. Zuma had to resign given uh, the corruption uh, scandal. As a matter of fact, elections were organized uh, in May, and the ANC received his lowest score uh, with uh, a little bit over 57%. We have also seen a substantial decrease of the Democratic Alliance, uh, 
which uh, was elected, which received only 20.8% of the vote, where we have seen a substantial increase of extremist uh, political uh, parties. For example, EFF, the Economic Freedom Front, uh, won 10.8%, up from 6.4%. Or the Freedom Front Plus also uh, won 2.4%. So we are seeing the increase of uh, extremes uh, uh, or extremist political uh, party. Now, of course, in the case of South Africa, we, we have a few challenges, especially the, the question of governance uh, with corruption, uh, the ESCOM, ESCOM scandal, uh, but we also have the question of uh, human capital, job creation, uh, among other, over 27% of uh, the population uh, doesn't have a quality job, uh, let alone uh, the level of education, among other challenges. We can also speak uh, about uh, women rights. Uh, during the World Economic Forum uh, that I attended uh, on Africa in September, uh, so many protesters uh, came uh, to contest the uh, way women are treated, violence against women. So this is the case of South Africa. Now, if I discuss a little bit also in Nigeria, elections were delayed uh, due to uh, violence. We had uh, conflicts, of course, you have uh, Boko Haram, but also the conflict between herdsmen and farmers. And the case of Nigeria is uh, where the uh, incumbent one uh, is quite uh, telling <coughs> because, as you know, Nigeria is the largest African economy and has numerous challenges. Of course, uh, Boko Haram, you have extreme poverty. Uh, so according to uh, some of the estimates uh, by my colleague uh, uh, and leader, uh, Homi Karasi here, so Nigeria is hosting uh, the highest uh, proportion of extreme poor people. And uh, we have also the separatist movement in the Biafra uh, region among other uh, factors. More than 94 million of people in Nigeria live under uh, uh, below poverty line, extreme poverty line. So uh, having said that, despite the challenges, we have seen uh, changes in countries uh, such as uh, Z uh, Zimbabwe, although uh, the uh, departure of uh, Mugabe had left the room to another not more accountable uh, leader. And perhaps uh, let me uh, highlight a positive development in the case of Kenya, for example, where the uh, Supreme Court had to uh, cancel the uh, elections, to, uh, although the incumbent uh, was supposed to have won. So I think overall those are some of the trends that we have. Uh, I am not certain, although in individual conversation, including some leader will tend to reject uh, the uh, question of democracies, and uh, accountability, uh, taking for illustration cases such as Rwanda or Ethiopia, uh, which are economic outperformers uh, per some of the indicators, uh, there is still a clear, a clear demand for democracy in Africa, and this is growing, at least according to Afrobarometer yeah. right. Thank you. Uh, Julia, you, you've had some interesting developments in Argentina of late, right? There have been elections there. There have been contested elections recently in Bolivia, a lot of upheaval in Chile. You know, start off where you want, but give us a okay. sense of, of, of <laughs> well, what's happening in Latin America and how can, how can we make sense yeah. of it? I will first start by thanking Sebastian and Homi for uh, having the opportunity of organizing and, and working on this together. Thank you very much. Um, it was a very intense electoral calendar this year, and actually last Sunday, well, well we have a round off in Uruguay, but oh, it's almost ended after um, six presidential elections this year, and if you start the cycle from uh, mid-2017, that is the start of the presidential cycle in Latin America, we had 12 elections. So I think there is a big trend that you can first take out of those uh, elections is that 
uh, you cannot say that we have now a trend towards the right or the left, but we have a trend towards punishing incumbents. And I think that's quite uh, an important trend, that it's quite different from what we had over the last wave of elections in Latin America. We used to have uh, longer electoral cycles and we start having uh, shorter, or at least this seems to be the start of a shorter electoral cycle where the electorate and especially the middle class are uh, angry, discontent because of the uh, uh, slow uh, <clears throat> economic uh, performance and starts punishing incumbents. Uh, you, we had, except for Bolivia, <coughs> Venezuela and Honduras with a lot of problems in those elections, irregularities, changes in the constitution, in those three countries incumbents were uh, re-elected, but it's... Um, very, very different what is going on from the other countries. And we had, uh, and the second trend is that we have the punishment in the ballots and also we have people in the streets. Uh, at uh, other times in history, I think we tend to go for one or the other. Now we have the two together. And I think that it's a novelty of these days, especially after what you were saying in the Chile, probably Chile is the most uh, surprising uh, situation because it's a. Uh, uh, I think it, it's quite different from other countries in Latin America. Chile is uh, very paradigmatic in many ways in the economic growth, in the stability of democracy, in the rule of law, uh, improvements over the return to democracy. The Chile, the Chilean case, I think, deserves some uh, separate attention. Um, I think if you could say uh, Argentina, it's getting to the limits of having inclusion without growth. Chile went to the limitations of having growth without inclusion. Um, and now we are debating how, and we were talking with Homi this morning, if it's, this is going to be the end of a model, of a successful model, or it's just the natural consequence of the model that we have um, a very uh, a bigger middle class, that it's having more demands, and Chile used to have a poverty rate of 40% and now has a poverty rate of 8%. So more than 30% of people are now uh, not hungry, are uh, asking for more, uh, for more public services. And, and I think it's no coincidence that in many countries in Latin America where all these uh, demonstrations are taking place, are after an increase in the public transport fares or the energy fares. So it has to do with the quality of public services. And I think it tells you a, a lot about what are the challenges ahead. Yeah. Great, well, thank you. Um, and, and, and Irfan, uh, you know, thinking about India, obviously 2019 has been a big year for elections there. Um, you know, many of you may have seen uh, the Economist last week. I believe it was had a special report on India, and was a, a lot of a pretty pessimistic take on what might lie ahead for uh, a second term for Modi. So, um, you know, what can you say about what these elections mean in terms of democracy in India, maybe for South Asia, or are there some broader global trends that we can see reflected in what's happening in India as well? Great. Um, so, I'm going to advance three propositions uh, generally for the sake of provocation and conversation mm -hmm. as we go forward. So for, let's start with South Asia. South Asia, I think, represents both the bright spot for democracy around the world in the sense that multi-party competitive elections are carried out across the region and have now for a while. Uh, but it is also, in a sense, sort of the canary in the, in the mine shaft, if you would, of the problems with democracy in the developing world uh, writ large. So this is probably reveals more about my college career than I want to, but right, think about having the, the, your college friend who went out seven days a week, came home at three in the morning every night, and managed somehow to be no worse for the wear, and 25 years later is still trying to do that, and now recovers a little slower, you know, <laughs> gets up a little later, looks a little worse around the eyes, and you suspect that the liver is about to fail at any moment. I think that's South Asia, right? I mean, in that... <laughs> Uh, we, we praised South Asia so much about the democracy because it rep represented for us, I think, in the 1990s, an example of a developing region, in India in particular, that was able to get competitive electoral democracy instantiated while ignoring the fact that the public institutions of each of these countries, whether it was the courts, whether it was media, whether it was the rules governing civil society, were being undermined 
from within, such that the supporting tissue, the liver, if you would, right, in this very terrible analogy of mine, right, was essentially being weakened. And now for us to sort of look and suddenly say, why is it that in Pakistan, 70 years after holding elections, we still don't have successful transfers of power from civilian government to civilian government, and even with Imran Khan in power, there are very few Pakistan observers I know of in Washington or elsewhere who actually think that the military is not really in charge and that the military's role in Pakistan society has become, in fact, if anything, greater uh, under in the last few years than it, than it used to be. Why is it that in Bangladesh, where we have competitive elections, those elections are increasingly characterized by violence against candidates and supporters, and you have an incumbent now who's in her third term, uh, you know, that's typically a bad sign when uh, people are winning three uh, consecutive terms. Uh, they tend to not want to give up power uh, the fourth time around. In Sri Lanka, we have an election coming up that everyone expects will be along ethnic lines in ways that might return Sri Lanka to really terrible days. And finally, you have India, right, which in many ways is, of course, still, and I want to make sure I say this clearly, still, I think, a paragon of virtue in terms of competitive elections, uh, right? Uh, in May, we had this election at the national level that led to Prime Minister Modi coming back with a tremendous majority. But yet, this last week, two states, Haryana and Maharashtra, where the BJP, his party, had been in power, went to the polls, and the same voters who five months ago had given the BJP a huge national mandate, the party lost seats in both states, right? Voters are sophisticated enough to be able to distinguish between national and state elections, and even what appears to be a behemoth, right, in the BJP, loses seats in competitive elections at the state level. So the economist, right, berating Mr. Modi is sort of interesting because in 2014, uh, Modi was their poster child. He was what was going to bring economic reform, the Gujarat model, and we very conveniently ignored the fact that until three months before Modi was elected in 2014, he was on a no visa list for the United States. I mean, we had the, the potential that a, a prime minister of India would have been denied a U.S. visa for the previous 10 years because of his alleged complicity in anti-Muslim riots in the state for which he was chief minister. And then he wins. The Economist puts him on the cover. President Obama embraces him, right, walks him around uh, the MLK memorial, etc., which is all fine. That's diplomacy. But the notion that we should suddenly be surprised that five years later, anti-minority prejudice is on the rise, that Hindu majoritarianism is on the rise, that the media is being cracked down against that civil society suggests to me a failure of memory that is pretty unconscionable when we come to analysis. So just to wrap this up, I think this is true then of the developing world writ large, and maybe, like I said, for provocation and conversation. I wrote a book a couple of years ago with Tom Flores and George Mason called Elections in Hard Times, where we analyzed every competitive national election, and competitive very broadly understood, right? There were more than two parties that were allowed to compete it didn't have to be a fair election, it didn't have to be a free election, but there were at least two parties allowed to be on the ballot. And we analyzed every election since 1945. It's, uh, it's available on Amazon in case you're looking for Christmas gifts mm -hmm. uh, for friends and family. Right? But what is true across the developing world is that we have undermined the ability for incumbents to run for elections on the basis of the kinds of things we know are good for democracy, programmatic appeals based on policy platforms, etc. Right? These are states that are largely bankrupt, that have impoverished in terms of their fiscal space, that are recovering from violent conflicts domestically, and what the democracy promotion industry has done, has gone out and say, hold a competitive election as quickly as you can, right, and let's hope it all goes really well, right, we'll send a couple of monitors, we'll do a, a we'll, you know, we'll advise you on how to set up your electronic voting machines, how to get voter rolls going. And guess what, in the in intervening five years after the monitors have left and before they come back for the next election, these are governments that are looking around and they don't have a budget with which to build schools. They don't have budgets with which to build infrastructure. They're, they're laden with structural adjustment programs from the IMF and others that push fiscal austerity. They become members of the WTO and have to cut trade taxes, which is the one thing developing countries know how to collect. When you, governments don't have the money to spend on big public policies, but still have to win an election, they use other tactics. They use patronage to their kinship groups. Uh, they give out pork, as it were. And when that fails, they harass, they intimidate, and when all of that fails, they steal elections outright. 
In other words, maybe we should be thinking really not about whether or not, I mean, then this research is fabulous, so this is not a criticism of that, but not in the sense whether individual citizens in these poor countries around the world are trying to figure out what democracy means, are committed or not, or whether or not the elections are free and clear, but whether or not the rules of the game in the international system have been rigged against any possibility of success for the consolidation of democracy uh, in the developing world. So I don't know whether that's a complete Halloween, like it really, really <laughs> pessimistic, mm -hmm. or maybe you know, for the sake of optimism, that what we know worked in the developed world is that it was the consolidation of states. It was state building that preceded democratization. What we're doing in the developing world by necessity is trying to build states at the same time as we build democracies. Uh, that is, that, that's what we've got to do. I'm OK with that. But we need to think about how to support them in doing that, how to actually take the development part of democracy and development as seriously as we do the democracy part. Or I think we set them up for failure. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you, you highlight some important ways that, that state building, the, the institutions play in making sure that democracies are healthy, right? Another type of institution that is widely viewed as being important to the success, success of a democracy right, are, are political parties, right? And, you know, in, in various parts of the world, party systems have been in upheaval. If you, certainly if you look at Europe, you know, the, the, some of the traditional parties have fallen away, new parties have arisen, party systems have uh, fractionalized and things like that. What role, and I'll, I'll stick with you, uh, Irfan, sure. for just a moment, then, in thinking about the, the, the institutional mix that a, a democracy needs, what role do political parties play? You know, what do, we, what do we know about the health of political parties in South Asia? And then, you know, generally, where are political parties at in, in either encouraging or not encouraging democratization in emerging nations? One of the canonical works in political science is a book from 1968 by Sam Huntington. Um, those of us who follow democracy know him maybe for the book he wrote in 91 called The Third Wave of Democratization. But in 68, he wrote a book called The Political Order of Changing Societies, in which he argued quite controversially for the time that the introduction of democracy in a lot of these newly in, uh, decolonized countries was going to cause chaos because essentially people were going to come in the streets and they were not going to have avenues by which to represent their views uh, to channel those in ways that were peaceful and productive for democracy. So when I see that high support for direct democracy in your slides, I channel Huntington and say that's not a good sign, right? That in fact representative party-based democracy, which is Huntington's analysis, is really what has kept uh, countries like India, the strong Congress party in its early years after independence, essentially on a democratic track. So I guess that's my way of saying I think parties are critical. I don't think we can think about democracy without strong political parties and party-based competition. And by that measure, I think this is another place where we need to be concerned. Uh, in South Asia, we have parties that have turned into per personalist vehicles. I mean, in India, you know, it's a bit of a joke as to the number of parties that can test any national election, thousands upon thousands. The average number of parties in every district in the parliamentary elections is over 10. Right? It's the same exact electoral system as America's. Right? It's a first past the post, whoever gets a plurality wins. In America, that has resulted in two parties competing in every election. In India, there's 10 different parties in every district. Because each party becomes a vehicle for me. Right? It's my party. It's for me. And then it'll be for my wife. And then it'll be for my son. And then it'll be for my son's wife. And we'll hand it down over generations. Uh, that means that no, <coughs> the basis for party loyalty Right, becomes much more personal than it does ideological and programmatic. And I think one of the things that we need to challenge ourselves on is that ideology kind of got a bad rap in the 90s and 2000s. We wanted these pragmatic technocrats who would go make good policy. But ideology is what binds parties, and parties are what support democracy. And so maybe we have to think about what kinds of ideology are we comfortable with as we go out and support and build parties in the developing world. Uh, Landry, you, you referenced, I think, in South Africa, you know, sort of lower vote shares for ANC, maybe compared to what they used to get. There's, as I understand, there have been some uh, divisions within the, the DA, the, the biggest opposition party in South Africa in recent months. Well, what do you say about the health of democracies and, and uh, health of political parties in Africa? Are there any trends we can talk about? Um, do you see the same problem with parties becoming too personalized around individual leaders, or, or, or what's your assessment? Uh, as a matter of fact, parties have 
parties have always been overly personalized on the continent. We have, we are seeing now an increase or a multiplication of political party. And uh, you highlighted a very important point, uh, the lack of programmatic uh, parties, political bodies, mm -hmm. uh, and mostly ethnically motivated or uh, ideologically motivated. So those are some of the trends that we have on the continent. In fact, we are uh, in countries such as uh, Benin, for example, leadership change occur with an outsider. So we often see outsider coming. So un unless we have a uh, more institutionalized uh, political uh, uh, party in a given country, or a variety of political parties, I think uh, African democracies will remain uh, quite uh, unstable. Now, coming back to one of the points that you mentioned about the relation between state building and democracy, I think I've conducted a study uh, at, the center, at the Stanford Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law, and looking at Africa as an uh, experiment. There is no clear connection between uh, what should come first, whether it's a strong state, uh, whether it's economic development or, or, uh, or uh, democracy. So what we have seen uh, on the continent is that we can have, uh, ideally, and I, I, I deeply believe that uh, quality institution and uh, state capacity are critical, no matter if the country is democratic or authoritarian, because uh, public services and goods have to be delivered to citizens, so independently of the nature of the political regime. So I guess in the case of Africa, I would say, yes, of course, we need support to uh, strengthen state capacity mm -hmm. and to reduce the gap between policy formulation and uh, implementation and implementation outcome. But however, I think that it is not, uh, and I don't say that you, it's what you meant, I, didn't, I don't think that it's either or, uh, because authoritarian regimes are very oppressive. And, and sometimes weak state is the only mean to remain indefinitely uh, in power. So sometimes state failure uh, or, 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 or fragile state are the fact of political leaders trying to keep power indefinitely. So I think it is important to uh, contextualize, at least uh, in the African case, yes, we need more support to state capacity, whether it's the, the, the independent of the nature of the political regime. But on the other hand, uh, it is important to make progress toward democracy uh, or, or at least a better representativity uh, of the citizens. Mm -hmm. Citizens are anyway demanding for it. Yeah, yeah. And, and Julia, it'd be you know, great to hear from you on the health of political parties or democratic institutions generally in, in Latin America. I also wanted to pick up on one really interesting thing you said a moment ago, which is that kind of two different things are happening, right? Like governments are, are being punished at the ballot box and people are getting into the streets too, right? And you see that obviously in Chile, other parts of the world recently, Lebanon, Hong Kong, elsewhere. There's, there's protests happening that are getting a lot of attention. Um, so I'm interested, in, in, and those are all driven by maybe different factors in different countries, but are there some commonalities too? Is there anything you see that like is happening in say Chile, for example, that resonates in other parts of the world? And you know, how effective are these protests? How effective is, are these instances in which people pour into the streets to try to bring about change? So take any of that you like. Okay, um, I was thinking of what you were saying about uh, more sophisticated voters, and I think that's the same is going on in Latin America because you had uh, voters punishing incumbents, but also uh, split, uh, doing more split ticket uh, voting mm -hmm. and having minority governments in Congress. So uh, voters are getting much more sophisticated and to put it quite provocatively, Political parties are not getting that sophisticated mm -hmm. in a way, so we have a we have a, an imbalance there where political parties and the and the ways in which representation is being channeled is is not being up to the task. And I think that uh, what we are discussing in Chile is that uh, we have now electoral participation in Chile at uh, 45 percent, almost half of what is electoral participation in Argentina, for example. So 
uh, uh, low levels of people are going to the, the ballot. And also, we are having political parties that look to be quite uh, unrooted from society. So I think there is a problem in political representation. And so when you have moments of economic growth, well, probably that is not that important. But when you are facing deep problems as we are facing now or starting to face, now you, you need uh, better representation. So that would be my first um, thought about that. And, and I think the other one is about this uh, kind of impressive thing that we are seeing kind of as uh, Homi was saying this morning, collective action. So uh, there's not coordination uh, for climate change of governments, but there's coordination of people in the streets that they all go to the streets at the same time in different places. So what can we tell about that? I think it's probably too early to tell, so uh, I won't um, take the, the risk of, of saying if how that is taking place. We know that social media and, and uh, it's, it's obviously playing a part. But I think that there is uh, quite evident that Latin America is facing uh, all over the rest of the world uh, uh, the problems of coordination. So we're not f having help from outside. Uh, problems are uh, uh, p very personalistic leaders in the, in the uh, mo most important countries uh, discussing on Twitter, uh, so there is there is a problem in the in the international order, and people uh, in Latin America are starting to feel that uh, they're a bit uh, felt behind. So I think that there is there is probably some uh, diffusion and replication of social demonstrations that uh, is taking place, and and at least in Argentina and in Uruguay, uh, we are seeing what is going on in Chile, and we start thinking, well. Maybe this is uh, also uh, important to take into account that some, something similar can happen uh, uh, soon. So I think uh, there is an interesting trend to look at, at how this coordination mm. takes place and how, uh, even if it's not coordination, but at least this diffusion and, and, and transmission from one country to another one. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting to think about uh, sort of a sophistication gap, as you kind of mentioned, right, between the voters on the one hand and these ossified political parties, and, and on the other hand, and political parties being uh, unable maybe to keep up with some of the changes happening in society and happening politically, one of which yeah. is where, Go ahead. I, yeah. I, I think there is something to take into account that I forgot is that we had a, an increase in middle classes in Latin America that by about, I think, 30, uh, 50 percent from 2003 to uh, 2009, in just six years, according to a World Bank report, the, the amount of uh, middle class people in Latin America has expanded very, very strongly. So I think that is uh, obviously part of the equation. We have more and more uh, people that uh, they have a job, but they spend two hours to get to their job on a very bad uh, uh, public transport. They have problems. Uh, sending their schools, uh, their kids to public schools because they have very low quality, so they, they struggle to get a private school. They have problems with <coughs> their health insurance because uh, the, ho the hospital in their village is not of a good quality. So uh, you, you have a better income, but that doesn't mean that you have a better uh, well, well-being in all the other dimensions, and I think that is part of the problem now. Mm. Their expectations have risen. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, so I appreciated the pushback, uh, and I agree. I mean, no part of what I said should be taken to mean that this is an endorsement of some sort of crude sequencing, right? <laughs> Let's suspend democracy for till we've got the development piece set. Let's suspend democracy till we have state building. But I think uh, we need to come to terms with the fact that the conditions under which we're asking developing countries to democratize in the current era are unlike anything for which we have successful precedent. Uh, so two facts, again, reported uh, in the book I mentioned. One is think about the post-conflict, right? At this point in time, by the data that Tom Flores and I collected, one out of every four elections happening at the national level anywhere in the world is happening in a post-conflict or conflict environment, right? There's either an active armed militancy happening somewhere in the country or they're, you're within five years of having had an armed insurgency, a civil war in your country. The idea that we can go from that 
to competitive elections that are going to be consolidatable, right, that we can consolidate, that are going to be long-lasting, as opposed to elections that are likely to re replicate the ethnic and other cleavages that had led to the conflict in the first place seems overly optimistic, if not outright naive. Right? And yet, that's exactly what we have asked these countries to do. When I talk about state capacity, I want to make it very concrete. I'm not talking about strong states, because strong states can be strong police forces. They can be the use of the military, et cetera. I want to think about fiscal capacity. Right? So again, these data are not perfect, because we don't do a great job uh, as a development community in being able to get a great access to tax data. But uh, to the best of our ability, we collected tax data. We normalized them. We corrected for currency fluctuations for interest rates, et cetera, right? So take that for what it's worth. Uh, by 2010, the average OECD country, including the United States, has an average per capita tax revenue approximating $10,000, right? Between eight and $10,000. This was 10 years ago. The average country in Sub-Saharan Africa had a tax per capita revenue of $150. In Sierra Leone, and again, these data are spotty, they're not perfect, but in Sierra Leone, by our calculations, if you start from when the Civil War begins to the current period, the average tax revenues that the state was collecting and reporting was a dollar, okay? Which is not to say that that's all the revenue, there's plenty of oil revenue, there's plenty of natural mineral revenue, but the state capacity to actually do things in public policy around which you build ideological political parties, around which you build programmatic policy, it has just been absolutely undermined. Latin America is interesting because Latin America, of course, is much richer when we, uh, just in terms of pure income. But I think it forces us to ask what, are the, what is the scar tissue of the frequent economic crises that have buffeted this region? So if you think of Argentina, right? I don't know that we have great research, and maybe you can point me to it, but of what happens to attitudes, what happens to the ties that bind politicians to their citizens in ways that are good for democracy, if every five years, as you were saying, we can essentially date, do you remember that crisis, or are you talking about this crisis, right? Uh, which currency crisis are we discussing? And the idea that citizens can, can experience these major shocks to their day-to-day -day life without it having an effect on how they think about the, the people who represent them the parties that claim to have had their best interests just, again, seems to me pretty atheoretical in ways that then lead us to be surprised when all of a sudden it appears that citizens are not enamored by some theoretical notion of uh, competitive democracy. Why should they be? So I, I do agree, but let's put in context the fact that without accountability, you will still have corruption. For example, uh, I conducting, when conducting some research, like, the cap there's a capacity problem in terms of ca tax collection, but there's also a corruption aspect. Uh, in some countries that are not necessarily named, the tax general manager can, uh, or director can offer a break of up to 30% to any uh, 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 taxpayer. The minister himself can offer a tax break of up to 80%. Now, what happened? Why don't we have enough resources? So yes, I do agree that we have a challenge of capacity, but even with the uh, actual capacity, what is the gap between the actual capacity and uh, the uh, outcome of what is collected? And I think part of uh, what explains the, the underperformance is, uh, of course, corruption and the limited rule of law, what I like to call rule by law. Sometimes you have clear rules, but leaders will be ap applying them to some uh, uh, and not other. To will be applying them uh, with uh, rigor to their opponent and not to their friend. So yes, state capacity is clear, and I totally agree with you. We cannot do much without state capacity, whether it's a, de a democracy or an authoritarian regime. However, if you don't have a certain form of accountability, uh, uh, even, uh, even with state capacity, uh, government will extract resources and direct them to their personal account versus serving public good. OK, uh, great. Well, let's, I want to make sure we have some time for uh, folks in the audience to participate as well. So let's, let's open it up for questions. And, and uh, yeah, we'll, we've got plenty of hands already. <laughs> then we have some microphones uh, circulating. Uh, so when you ask a question, please identify yourself. Keep the questions brief. 
And uh, what we'll do is we'll collect three questions and give our panelists then a chance to respond. I think maybe we're starting off back here. Is that right? Is that colleague? Yes. Hi, I'm John Zemko with the Center for International Private Enterprise. As I'm listening to you know where we started um, about the polling on democracy and how people feel about democracy in general, for those of us who've been working in this world of democracy development for quite a few years, I've begun to ask myself, do we really know enough? We know how people feel about democracy or, or, or lack thereof, but do we really know about how enough about how people feel about their democracies or how they understand their democracies or their lack of democracy for that matter? And I'm wondering if we couldn't do collectively, the, the moderator and the panelists in, in, in particular, is there more that we need to do in the international community to understand what lacks in these democracies to help bring that understanding, not just about how they feel about the, the term, but how they understand the term in their context? Yeah, thank you. Okay, let's get uh, two more. Uh, maybe right here. Oh, thanks. I'm John Coonrod with The Hunger Project, and I'm a nut for decentralization. Um, development happens in communities. All politics is local, and de having democracy that delivers really requires strong local governments, and um, Africa, other than Kenya, and Indian states, other than Kerala, maybe Tamil Nadu, have very weak local governments, very underfunded local governments. And so I just wonder, and this move to autocracy is re-centralizing a lot of power in a number of countries. So I'm wondering what any of you have seen in trends towards uh, strengthening local, um, you know, local governance and greater devolution of resources as a key to having democracy that can deliver. I think maybe we have one more back over right here. Is that right? I don't. I can see. No, yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Andre Goodfriend, a, a serving Foreign Service officer. Uh, in, in discussing <coughs> democracy, the uh, I think there's a. Uh, we've talked about direct representation or representation of direct democracy, but uh, in, there's a, there's a um, what's missing perhaps is a definition of liberal democracy, uh, with particularly uh, in that either direct democracy or representative democracy could be liberal or not liberal, either majoritarian if it's let's say not uh, if it's uh, not liberal or constrained by respecting universe the universality of, of human rights if it is liberal uh, in looking at the democracy in these various regions there's a uh, and particularly with the growth of populism uh, which I think uh, uh, divides groups into a an internal group and an external group and talks about how we the people, and our will should not be constrained by laws, that the will of the people should always be, uh, should always supersede laws, uh, at, which is, is a growing trend in pushing for democracy. How is that reflected in the various, <clears throat> in the various uh, studies that you've made in the various areas as there is this push for what appears to be uh, a majoritarian uh, democracy that's particularist in its focus rather than a more liberal democracy that's universalist with respect for human rights. Great. All right, let's, let's stop there and we can take these, these three questions. Maybe we, should we start maybe with the last one about sort of majoritarian versus liberal conceptions of democracy. Is, you know, I don't know, Julia, you want to take that and, and talk about what you see? Um, definitely a very good point and, uh, and it was absent from our previous conversation. I tend to think that when we compare uh, situations of polarization in, in some of our countries in Latin America and say, well, it's quite similar to what is happening in the United States uh, in, in terms of how polarization takes place in, uh, on the social media and, and in the public discourse, we tend to forget that it's not the same to have polarization in a liberal democracy than in a democracy where the liberal component is very weak and polarization is quite more dangerous when you don't have a very strong rule of law institutions. 
And my take and, and, and uh, uh, building on what you were saying uh, uh, previously is that when you have the uh, process of building a state at the same time of building uh, the democratic institutions, we, we had the tendency of uh, put more importance on, on the majoritarian part of the equation rather than on the liberal part of the equation. And I think what, is, what we are witnessing in several countries in Latin America, and we are seeing it now with the election results in, in, in Bolivia, for example, uh, is that the liberal uh, part of democracy is still very, very far away from for being uh, developed. And I think in this uh, scenario of demonstrations in the streets and a lot of demands from, from the public, it's, uh, the tension uh, grows, and I think it's quite complicated, and it will probably get more complicated in the, in the future. Yeah. And then maybe we can talk about decentralization of, of Landry, or, or if you have thoughts about like, you know, sure. the, what's happening at the I local level. I want to start though with your question. So and I agree completely with what Julia said. But I want to use a different word, right, than liberal. Really, I think what we've understood at this point, and this is what I think what animates our, our recognition that liberalism as a concept is what is missing in a lot of electoral democracies, is that the institutions that preserve liberalism are counter-majoritarian, right? That the reason that they do what they do, the reason that they can talk about the universality of human rights is because they do not bow to popular pressure and therefore are not subject to the whims of uh, majority opinion. That is when the courts do their job well, right? That is when the media does its job well. It punches up as opposed to punches down. It becomes a way to check government as opposed to. For, for populations, A, that's an incredibly sophisticated concept, right? We like to win. And if we've just won an election and our guys are in charge, we want them to be able to do a bunch of stuff. And if all of a sudden some court is telling them you can't do this, we get frustrated. It's not just in India, it is in advanced industrial democracies, it's here in the United States uh, as well. The stakes of what it means to be counter-majoritarian have really been changed though, because so much of this competition has become on the basis of identity politics, mm -hmm. in terms of it becomes zero sum as opposed to in terms of economic policy debates. So if you take India and the last election, right, Hindu majoritarianism was visible in the political campaign. That is both because the party had a particular campaign strategy, but also because on economic issues, there is very little daylight between the major parties, right? The, the signature uh, policy achievement of the current government, uh, what is called the goods and services tax, or GST, right, was developed by the previous government, right? And I can go down a list of six to eight major initiatives that have literally just been named. I mean, they changed the acronym to include a different leader as opposed to the old leader in what they did. They, they don't do disagree about cash transfers, they just disagree about how large the cash transfers would be, right? So, but when you're debating issues as to what the role of minorities, what is the identity of the nation, then there's zero sum. And then when the courts intervene, right, uh, it becomes the stakes are just a great deal higher. And so I think we want to think about counter-majoritarianism. I think the devolution, your point, so it's a very good one. And Anjali Bolkin, who's a professor at Georgia Tech, has written a book about, essentially about, I think it's called Democracy from Below, or, but essentially arguing that, the, and has collected a global data set on decentralization reforms and the democratization of decentral. In India, we've seen, actually, I think we're going to see a stripping away of panchayat-level uh, powers by the current government. Uh, but what, and so, which is, I think, troubling for public service delivery and last mile uh, delivery. But it's also the case that we have had this philosophy in India where the local elections are not partisan elections. You contrast that to the United States where you know the joke is that all the way down to the dog catcher, there's a party ID. And there is something about learning party loyalty. There's some, so I guess maybe what I want to say is that the language of polarization has a dangerous slippery slope to be arguing that we should not care about party labels, that those are problematic. We should all be some sort of notion of independence. We go for the best policy. We go for the best uh, ideas. When in fact, parties, right, and part, partisan polarization is what makes democracy work, as long as what they're organized around are things that are not easily construed as zero sum, right, and that don't involve people as much as they involve ideas and the share of a budget. 
It's a different way of thinking about it. So <coughs> quickly, uh, electoral versus liberal democracy. I think in most of the African countries, we have uh, what I like to call, uh, including democratic countries, hyper-presidentialism. Mm -hmm. So which means that we have elections, they may be free, fair, meaningful, but once elected, the leader may rule almost like in an authoritarian country. And this is partly explained by the weak uh, horizontal accountability. So I have just published a, a book chapter on horizontal accountability uh, and uh, the challenge to democratic uh, development in Africa. So that is one of the telling parts. Most of the president can do almost anything uh, and they will not face the, the, the rigor or either the uh, uh, constitutional code or of the parliament. So uh, a, a policy option could be to really empower uh, and increase the autonomy of uh, institutions uh, such as parliament, supreme court, the judiciary uh, in general. Yes, local development is critical, but on the other hand, uh, it is important uh, to also have quality leadership. Because as of now, we have local leaders who have budget, and although it is still uh, asymmetrical, uh, they are still not delivering to the extent of the budget that they receive. So uh, we can also have a reproduction of the national uh, dysfunctioning at the local level. So it's really important to build quality institution uh, uh, and capacity at the local level and not just expect that by uh, decentralizing will uh, automatically have better outcomes. And uh, finally, uh, what people understand about democracy, I think that in some of the Afro barometer surveys, I was shocked to see that in some of the authoritarian countries, more than half of the population were thinking that they were in a democracy. Yep. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. so it is, so which means that education uh, uh, remain and political socialization remain uh, critical. Yeah, that's the thing we've seen in our surveys as well is that, let's say, people will support uh, free expression, but they define it very differently in different parts of the world, right? So some of them, what, what these principles mean sometimes really varies around the world. Okay, let's get uh, maybe three more questions. Yeah, so, uh, if we can get one, maybe you, and then you, sir, <coughs> and maybe one more in the back. Andres Ortega, um, uh, from El Cano Institute in Spain, and here a visiting fellow at the CSIS for some weeks. Just a question, taken, leaving aside China, no? uh, do you think in your, area, in your areas or in your countries, new technologies, especially IT technologies, have empowered more society and the people, or the government and the state? Great, thank you, okay. Let's get uh, two more, I think the gentleman over here. Good morning. My name is Julian Goldstein. I'm a junior international affairs um, major at Howard University, also a writer with the Political Review on campus. Uh, with, especially with respect to development and coupling that with democracy, um, I believe a source in two, uh, the World Bank in about 2017-18 had cited that about seven out of ten of the world's fastest growing economies were all within the continent of Africa, um, partly tied to and related to investment from Chinese stakeholders. Uh, could you uh, discuss, um, particularly you, sir, on how uh, when you talk about uh, ide ideological trends within and shifting investment into the continent, as well as how the CFA, Frank, plays a major consequence in lack of development throughout the Western region. Great. Is there anyone else uh, have a question they want to add? Just let me, yes. Yeah. Hi, my name is Laura. I work at IREX. Um, my question is actually for Julia. Um, what do you see the trends in the region are related to freedom of the press? vis-a-vis -vis the role of the press in the democratic process. Thank you. Great. All right. Uh, Julia, you want to just start off with the last one here? Okay, the last one, and, and also I would like to say something about Andres. Um, yeah. I, will st I will start with the new technologies. I definitely think that they are sh reshaping politics, uh, in, at least in, in Latin America, 
and you were talking about local governments and devolution and part of the local reaction is taking place on the social media. So I think all this debate about the role of local governments now is much more influenced by, by social media and new technologies and actually more than probably national politics. We have people uh, sending messages on WhatsApp about uh, the services that are not working in their village and there's a lot of... Uh, uh, of, of demand, I think that is also in the anxiety also is being increased by by new technologies. Um, there's a, a friend of us uh, working in the creative sector that says that we we wait no more than 45 seconds to answer a WhatsApp message from a friend. So if we cannot wait more than 45 seconds, so how how are we going to expect that the government takes? years to uh, I know, uh, build a new um, uh, highway in our village. So we are, get, we are getting much more uh, anxious, and I think that it's a problem, especially for local governments. Uh, and regarding, Laura, your question about freedom of the press, I, I don't think that the trend is uh, very positive in some of the countries. Uh, I think that there are uh, the social media and new technologies are pushing for more freedom of information and, and, and freedom of the press. But because many of the media outlets are um, being purchased and, and are owned by uh, governments, there is still part, part of the the deficit in the rule of law and liberal democracy, I think, has to do with the role of, of press, and especially with the cases of corruption. That uh, we, ha we haven't uh, talked about corruption, but definitely it's still a very important problem in Latin America, and it's something that is also triggers uh, uh, demands when you are facing a bad economic situation. So I think that we, we have to keep looking at these, uh, these trends very closely for the next years. Then, Landry, there was a question about uh, China and Africa, if you want to respond. Uh, so uh, China, China, the Chinese uh, presence in Africa, and I think we hosted uh, the president of Guinea uh, <coughs> recently, and uh, his point was he's open to capital coming from any country. So competition is healthy. I think the challenge is what African leaders do with those resources or the type of deal that they negotiate. Are they negotiating deals to serve uh, the uh, public goods or are they negotiating bad deals to enrich themselves? I think that is probably uh, one of the uh, uh, challenges. So yes, Africa fast economic performance. You have seen the African continental free trade area, which was adopted last year, uh, came into force um, this year, and country will start trading next year as of July. So uh, definitely, uh, new technologies are contributing also to the fast economic performance. Before, uh, in the late 90s, uh, New York City had more mobile phone subscribers than Africa, and now. Africa uh, has hundreds of million, uh, uh, has uh, many, uh, uh, over 700 uh, million mobile phone subscribers. So this, these are other important, which facilitate political protest. You have seen what happened in Sudan, for, for example, when uh, the, the, the protest started uh, as, uh, with economic motivation, and given the increase of the cost of bread, something as basic as that. And given the lack of reaction of the government, uh, become uh, a, a political protest, which follow the model of political transition in, in Africa. And by the way, we have an, a political transition tracker at the Africa Growth Initiative. So you can look at it on our website, where since independence, we have been monitoring uh, leadership change uh, on the uh, continent. Related to France and uh, CFA, uh, of course, we have had many challenges uh, in the past uh, few years. Uh, but what is more important is the alternative proposed by African leaders. So we have, we don't have a uh, unique voice. For example, leaders such as uh, the president of Chad uh, 
will be voicing his concern and will be strongly opposed, where you have leaders such as uh, the president of Senegal or the president of Cote d'Ivoire uh, who will be promoting such a currency. Uh, it is critical for any country to control its monetary policy. So that is a matter of fact. Now, what are leaders doing to uh, uh, organize an appropriate transition? I think uh, that will remain uh, a question uh, of concern. And if I want to give you a chance to weigh in on the, the question about technology, sure. you know, what, how is it impacting things in India or South Asia? So again, you know, best of times, worst of times. I mean, in every village that I go to in India, there's now kiosks at which farmers can get 20, 30 pub services from the government, no longer having to go stand in line, no longer have to pay a middleman because technology allows that to be much more directly accessible, whether it's the printing of a birth certificate, a land title, marriage certificate, et cetera. So in the sense of public service delivery, I would say that citizens have been much more empowered by technology, including the digitization of records, making them more amenable to freedom of information requests. In India, we call it the right to information, RTI, uh, as well. So those, I think, are the positive and you know, uh, quite obvious. We are, in a sense, because of the communications and WhatsApp uh, has been in the news quite a bit in Facebook because of the role of disinformation uh, in South Asia. I mean, what the, literally the WhatsApp changes to the number of people you can forward a message to in one go. It's now limited to five people at a time, right? It was made in response to the Indian uh, elections where mass WhatsApps were being sent to spread rumors that were being linked to the onset of violence uh, in a riots against uh, minority communities, et cetera. So, the, how to regulate that information landscape uh, means that the technology companies are so far ahead of the governments that have to deal with them uh, that we either get very ham-handed approaches or we get pretty imperfect uh, kind of ones. On this, I think the question of privacy is going to be the critical one. And so maybe I'll close with that. The, the breaking story in the Indian press over the last 24 hours has been the revelation that uh, someone, we don't know who yet, used state-of-the-art Israeli spyware to monitor the WhatsApp chats of a couple of dozen significant civil society leaders and journalists, right? Apparently, this is extremely state-of-the-art. I mean, the, the supposition or the allegation is that the government has something to do with this, right? Uh, but in a world in which, right, so much of this is being done over WhatsApp, so much is being done electronically, the ability of governments to monitor journalists and to uh, constrain free speech uh, is something that I think we're going to have to keep an eye on because that technology is evolving so rapidly, both in terms of our ability to be a little hidden from government, to organize on social media, but also government's response to that is to find new surveillance technologies. So in that sense, we're in a brave new world, right? And, but it's not undeniable that technology has both brought governments much closer to people in terms of service delivery, while maybe having some deleterious effects on the quality of information, the quality of conversations, and the polarization of society. Similarly, uh, Facebook has just uh, announced that they suspended uh, three account networks, which were linked to, I think, mm -hmm. over 200 accounts and one million people influencing or interfering uh, in uh, domestic politics in <coughs> Africa, including supporting parties, candidates, or promoting wow. special interests. Yeah. Uh, and linked to a uh, Russian uh, financier. So, so, though, so technology could both, uh, or technology represents both a unique opportunity to advance uh, democratic uh, development, but uh, also can pose a risk if uh, countries uh, do not take the appropriate uh, policy uh, measures yeah. to prevent uh, such disinformation and manipulations. Okay, well, we're almost out of time. Let me just ask real super brief answers from our, our, our panelists. Yeah. We've talked a little bit about the year that's behind us now. What are you going to be looking for in 2020 in terms of <laughs> the indicators that tell us something about the health of democracy in the regions that you're focusing on? Like, what, what should we be looking for in the coming year and paying attention to? We'll start with you, Rafan. What, what should sure. you look for? I mean, year? the most immediate is this election that's coming in Sri Lanka. And I think we've got to keep an eye on it. There's a real concern that this, as I said, is going to be fought on pretty significant ethnic lines. Uh, there's a number of 
ruling families, right, uh, who have multiple members. There's some 12 candidates running for president, three from the same family. Uh, so this doesn't bode well. We should keep an eye on that. And I want to just make sure we mention Afghanistan, right? As a South Asianist, I'll be a little imperial and we'll claim Afghanistan as South Asia. That's how it is at the Atlantic Council where I also have an affiliation. But what's happened in Afghanistan is just is sad, right? I mean, well, this election both represents the incredible bravery and commitment to democracy of the Afghan people. I'm not sure I would go have gone and voted uh, given the risks to voting that are there, but a low turnout and now a set of results that have been delayed significantly uh, in a way that's going to undermine the legitimacy of the results one way or the other. And so I think those are the two that I would ask all of you to pay attention to. Great. What about uh, Latin America? There is no election to see because they are almost over. So <laughs> now we are going to uh, have to take uh, attention of how this new cycle evolves. I will say two things that we need to pay more attention. One is the impact of the lack of regulation of platform um, economies and the impact on the uh, labor market. I think it's something we have many, many people now in Latin America working as independent <laughs> workers for uh, these platforms, and it's part of a uh, very different type of an informal economy in Latin America. I think that is going to impact on democracy and on attitudes toward democracy. And another trend uh, in society that will have an impact on democracy is whether we go on regulating uh, uh, the use of Facebook or the use of uh, how we regulate algorithm and what is Latin America going to do about that. That is now it's quite an absent discussion, uh, although Europe is uh, working on that. There's a lot of debate in other countries. In Latin America, there's no debate about how we should go on with yeah. that. Big issue in lots of places these days. Yeah. Landry, uh, what about Africa? So uh, our thing that, uh, that a couple of things, one is to watch uh, carefully at all the political uh, or popular mobilization that we will have on the continent. So we may have a downfall of more uh, authoritarian leaders than people think. So watch very closely. Mm. So the second point is to invest uh, in state capacity. I guess you'll be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> but also in uh, political uh, party institutionalization, because without the institutionalization of political party, we cannot uh, be going far, uh, as well as on cyber security. Uh, because most of the African, the website of most of the African governments, including some from presidencies and uh, ministers or mi ministries of interior, central banks, could be hacked in a matter of minutes. So cybersecurity will be very critical, and that do it doesn't just uh, concern Africans, but also anyone else engaging with Africa. So we are all concerned. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks again to Brookings and CPEC. Thanks to all of you for coming. And join me in a round of applause for thanking uh, all of our panelists. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.